Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Fantastic, fantastic. Um, we are currently in a sermon series that we've titled The Resurrected Life. The Resurrected Life. And I believe it's been incredible. Uh, God has revealed to me, uh, as I have studied his word so much, of who he is and what he has called me and us, for those who've crossed the line of faith, what he's called us to be about. Uh, the first week, uh, we kind of began by anchoring ourselves in the book of Philippians, where Paul says that his goal is to know him, that him is Jesus Christ, and to know the power of the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, through his life and to share in Jesus' sufferings, that, that his whole life is about that, is, is I just want to know more of Christ, that I, I, I'll never get to the end where I'm like, you know what, I feel like I've got it all, I'm good. No, 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 there's always so much more to know. And then to live out of the power of the resurrection. So, so that's where we began. Uh, and then Dr. Bat came and, I mean, like absolutely incredible, where he says, look, the resurrected life is a life of worship because the Lord is my banner. I look to him and therefore I can worship regardless of the circumstances that I find myself in. I always keep my eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of my faith. The resurrected life is a life of worship. And then last week we looked at how the, the resurrected life is a life of sowing and reaping. That we are called to sow and reap. That it is part of the kingdom rhythm of life. And so this week... We're going to talk a little bit about mission. We're going to talk about mission, right? That the resurrected life is a life on mission. Yeah. It really is. That, that none of us, none of us who have crossed the line of faith should ever say, gosh, I'm bored. Sure. You cannot. If you are on mission, there is no ways that you would ever be bored. And we're going to take a, little, a look at that this morning. I'm going to read our passage, our anchor passage. We're going to be in two portions of Scripture, but we're going to anchor ourselves in Matthew chapter 9. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me there. We're going to be reading from verses 35 all the way to 38. I'll read it, and then I'll pray. I'm going to pray for you. I'll ask that you pray for me, uh, and then we'll get to work. Is that okay? Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Look at the time. Good. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Hear these words of our Father. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion. Say compassion. compassion. Say compassion. compassion. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are old words. These are ancient words, but they're not dead. They're very much alive. God, would you meet us where we are? That all of us have walked in here and carrying a lot of things. Some are excited and happy, and some are filled with worry and anxiety. God, would you meet us here in this moment? Would you show us through your word what it looks like to be on mission, that you have called all of us to be on mission? Help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, lead. I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. I ask, Lord, that you would protect us, that you would watch over us. God, it's through that end that I ask that you stand in my body, that you would think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The resurrected life is a life on mission. Verse 35 says, Jesus continued going around all the towns. The English Standard Version says cities, cities and towns and villages. What was he doing? He was teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Jesus is out there proclaiming the kingdom, 
calling people to repentance. But, but he's not just doing that. He's also healing every disease and every sickness. He's engaging in the brokenness of this world. See, I, I think as the church, in the last couple hundred years, we've made the mistake of only doing half of what we see here. We, we have a, a group of people that say, you know, we just preach the gospel and that's it. We don't engage in the brokenness of this world. All we are called to do is preach and teach and that's it. But, but then when, if we read the text, we go, no, hold on. He's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing every disease and every sickness. I know that we have failed here because the world, those who, who don't look to Christ as Lord and Savior, well, they'll go, hey, I'm concerned about the brokenness of this world, and I'm going to engage. This is why we have so many NGOs, and they are engaging. But the church, we sit back and we go, no, we don't do that. We just preach, and that's it. The, the, the world is too broken for us. It's too messed up for us. But yet here we see Jesus engaging. He's healing every disease and every sickness. The church cannot be irrelevant, must not be irrelevant. That we are called to engage. Jesus did not limit himself and his acts of kindness and compassion to his own city, to his own area. No, 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 no. We're told he went to every town and every village. He went everywhere his human capacity could take him. Remember, he was fully man, fully God, but fully man. Yeah. And so he went everywhere his human capacity could take him. They didn't have cars back then. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have technology. But man, if they did, I think Jesus would have gone even further. Yeah. Preaching and teaching and healing. He did not limit himself and his acts of kindness and compassion to his own city, but he took a trip all throughout Galilee and, and not only visited the larger and, and more major cities and towns, but their villages also, doing good to the bodies and souls of men and women in every place, whatever state he found them in. That's Jesus. He's on mission. Jesus banished sickness and disease from his presence through his ministry of healing. The blind received their sight. The lame walked. Lepers were cleansed. The deaf could hear and the dead were raised. Jesus healed every kind of sickness and, and every kind of disease, disease as he ministered throughout Galilee. Jesus was on mission. I'm trying to make the point here and I'm trying to make it clear. But the text doesn't just tell us what he did. It also tells us why he did it. Verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected. The NIV and the ESV says it this way, because they were harassed and helpless. The New King James Version says it this way, because they were weary and scattered. The message says that they were confused and aimless. They were not in a good situation. Jesus wants us to see what he saw in the crowd. They were battered and bruised and distorted and ripped apart and worn out. They were exhausted. Sound familiar? That's like us today. I believe we, we live in a world of another one. And yeah, I'm not talking about DJ Khaled and his amazing beats. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the brokenness of this world. I, I feel like it's, it's, we're just in a constant state of another one. Another war. Another senseless shooting. Another act of gender-based Violence, another, another farm murder, an, 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 another divorce. Just the other week I heard, yet again, students urinating on other students. This happened when I was studying. This is more than 10 years ago, and I thought, you know what, we're done with this. We've learned it'll never happen again. Another one. 
broken, shattered, worn out, exhausted. This is what Jesus saw. Friends, we see this. You don't have to go too far. I know many of us will, will try to hide from the brokenness of the world by living in our estates with high walls, electric fences. And I'm not throwing punches because I live in one of those. But we don't have to look that far to find another one, another xenophobic attack. And yet Jesus was filled with compassion for them. You know what I want to do? I just want to leave. I just want to get out. Surely there's somewhere else in this world where it's easier. Jesus is filled with compassion. The Greek word here for compassion is, is splach nizome. Splach nizome, which we can inadequately translate in English to, to have compassion. And yet in the Greek, its meaning is so much stronger. Splach nizome is, is to be deeply moved to be so affected in one's inner being. Splach, nizome. Jesus felt a deep compassion. How, how, do we, how do we know this? Luke chapter 19, verse 41 to 44, we find Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. It says here, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. Because he was filled with compassion, recognizing the brokenness of the city, of this world. He, he's filled with compassion, and so he begins to weep. How I wish today that you all people would understand the way to peace, he says. I wish you would understand. I wish, I wish that you would see, you would see that I am here because I am ushering in peace. Because you are all broken. And all of you, all of us are in desperate need of a savior. How I wish you would see, Jesus says. He wept over his city. When was the last time you wept over ours? I mean, we can complain. And, and with these fingers, we are so good. This is how I feel. This place sucks. This place is horrible. And I get it. It's a, like we should be filled with righteous anger because we're going, this is not how we should live. But that righteous anger should lead us to a place of deep compassion. Because had it not been for the Lord, Amen. had it not been for His saving grace, I would have been there. Splach nizome. Compassion, according to Matthew, is to be deeply moved that you would want to exchange places with the one that you feel compassion for because of what they are going through. To, to look and to go, you know what, like, I, if, if only, if only I could get in your mind and go, that is not how you are to think. If only I could be your hands and go, that's not what they were made to do. If I, only I could get into your heart and go, you're not supposed to feel that way. Splach, nizome. And, and we know that G Jesus, he, he didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the talk. He's not just saying, I, I feel compassion for you. And he's like, well, I'm just saying it. Hopefully they'll get it and then they'll act. No, 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 no. He, he says this at the end of doing so many compassionate things, so, many, so, so much engaging. I mean, if, look, I, I read to you the end of, of Matthew 9, but if we start the chapter, we see right here that, that Jesus healed a, a, a paralytic man. He engaged. He saw the brokenness and he engaged. We see Jesus engaging with tax collectors. He calls Matthew. Who, who back then, friends, back then being a tax collector was not a good thing. Yeah. It was not a good look. I know some of you are going, yeah, but, you know, we still don't think that SARS is a good look. That's <laughs> way worse. Way worse back then. 
Because, because the Roman Empire would, would use the, the, the people uh, who, who they colonized, because that's what it was, uh, and they would say, now you go collect these, these unjust taxes from your own people. You were a traitor. A traitor. And yet we see Jesus not only engage them, but he calls one of them to be his disciples. He hangs out with them. He has dinner at Matthew's house and a bunch of Matthew's friends who I guess were also tax collectors and they show up. Because he's going, Matthew, this is not how you are to live. He, he restores a, a, a woman who, who had been bleeding for 12 years and, and, and also heals a, a young girl 12 years old who had died. He engages in the brokenness of this world. He heals two blind men. He drives out a demon. He walks the talk. Engage. Feel the compassion and then engage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. His compassion led him to the point where he says, I'm going to exchange places with those who are broken. Splach nizome. But he goes on to say, they are like sheep without a shepherd. That's part of the problem. Is that they are like sheep without a shepherd. These these. Sheep had no shepherd, no one to protect and guide them. Even though there were leaders who who were there and who were supposed to do that, they had stopped doing it completely. They had become wolves in sheep's clothing. And so now there was just chaos. In Luke chapter 19, after Jesus weeps, we should take a look and, and see what he does. Verse 45 to 48, he then cleanses the temple. He looks and he goes, this is chaos. Where are the leaders? Well, they're behind the scenes doing corrupt things. And so he says, okay, cool, then I'm just going to cleanse the temple. I'm just going to cleanse the temple. The, The leaders had turned the house of prayer into the house of prophet. They were lining their pockets The absence of the priority of prayer in the church is a significant indication that it has abandoned its primary calling. When we no longer have place for prayer, we should be concerned. We should be concerned. Because at the very least, we should be praying for those who who are broken and who are in desperate need of a savior. At the very least. Or we go, no, 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 we, we don't have time for that. We're busy doing other things. That should be concerning. Where is that compassion? Jesus then shifts the metaphor from flock to field. Jesus now envisions an enormous crop that is ripe and ready. One that is in need of harvesters. The unreached people of this world, this continent, this country, this city, your neighborhood, your workplace, your classroom. He transitions. He says they are in need of more faithful disciples of Jesus who are filled with the gospel, filled with compassion to go and engage and share the good news. Verse 37 says this. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Remember last week sowing and reaping? The harvest is abundant. It's abundant. The ripe harvest, this is, this is what he's saying here, don't miss it. The, the, this ripe harvest can go to waste if there are no workers or no laborers to take advantage of the abundance. Do, do you see that? Because it, it's, it's ready. But if we sit back and do nothing, then what? What do you think? What do you think is going to happen? Jesus warns us that the opportunities to meet human need and bring people into his kingdom may go to waste because of a shortage of workers. Church, where are we? In light of that, where are we? 
Have we found comfort in our own lives and just, hey, you know what, this is cool for me. I don't want to get engaged. It's too messy. Or do we recognize that the harvest is ready, it's abundant, it's ripe? John chapter 4, verse 35 to 36, Jesus quotes an old familiar saying at the time. He says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest? That's what the people would say. And then he says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. We, we sit here and we go, no, 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 you know, we need a plan. We need to have a strategy. We need to put this in place. We need to, you know, we, we still got time. We still got time. And he's going, no, it's now. It's in this very moment. The harvest is ready. Yeah. Don't miss it. Yeah. Jesus refers to them as workers, implying those who work. It's quite obvious. And this work is not done by fans who sit in the stand. It's not done by those who just simply sit and watch. It's, it's done by workers. Why? Because workers work. The need that Jesus saw and wanted his disciples to see was great. It's everywhere. It's everywhere that you go. At your favorite shopping center, the harvest is ripe. Where you go and train, the harvest is ripe. In your neighborhood, the harvest is ripe. And if you are in Christ, then you are one of those workers who, who is sent out. And so in verse 38, Jesus makes his request to them to respond to this need. He, he, he says, okay, here's, here's what's going on. The harvest is ready. Now I'm going to make the request. In verse 38, he says, therefore... Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, if you're like me, because I'm an eager beaver, if you're like me, this should surprise you. Because after saying so much, after, after setting the scene, after telling us that the harvest is ripe, it's ready, he, he, here's what Jesus then says. Pray. But, but Jesus, I'm ready to go. I've been, I've been inspired. I've been motivated. Vision has been cast. I'm ready to go. He says, no, 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 no. The harvest is abundant. Ready, set, pray. Pray. And here's why Jesus says pray. Because he recognizes that we are human. You and I, human. Despite the fact that, 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 yes, we are children of God, but, but, but we are human, flesh and blood. And all of us have 24 hours in a day. doesn't matter how much your grind and your hustle is, you have 24 hours in a day. And at some point, you've got to go to sleep. Whether on your own terms or you just burn out. We are human. And, and it's Jesus recognizing this. He goes, okay, look, the harvest is, is abundant. It's ready. But you're going to need to pray. What he's saying is that it's so grand. It's so massive that, that in your human capacity, there's no ways that you'll be able to do it. That you need to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered. You need to cry out to the Father and ask Him, ask Him to, to help and to guide and to lead. We need to pray, friends. Yeah. Yeah. Also, when we pray, what we're communicating is that, God, we're concerned about more than what I can humanly do. Yeah. Right. Oh, we, we think praying is about just asking for stuff. Yeah. And it's part of it. It definitely is. But when we pray, we're acknowledging that we are not God. The problem is that we wait until it's too late to recognize that. I am not all powerful, I am not all knowing, and I am not all present. God, you are. And so I'm going to pray. Empower me, empower us. We pray. 
All our missions and multiplication and sharing the gospel and discipleship, all of it is fueled by prayer. It's fueled by prayer. I know we've got great strategies, great curriculum, great programs, but all of that is fueled by prayer. And, and it's so sad that so many of us, we don't pray. We just don't. If it's because we're not doing anything, then, then it's because we're trying to do everything out of our own strength. And that's not going to help us. It's not going to get us anywhere. We need to pray. He says pray. We pray for countries and cities and people that need to be taught the rich word of God and hear the scandalous gospel that brings people from darkness to light. Yeah. And as we do so, what does God do? He sends. He sends. He hears the prayers of his children. And he goes, okay, great, I'm sending. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The Greek expression for send out is, is ekbalo. Ekbalo. And it's, and it's way more aggressive than the English send out. Send out is so polite. I'm sending you out. No, in the Greek it's ekbalo. It, 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 it's kind of being pushed out. We're praying that God, you would push out your people, your workers, your laborers. And we need to be pushed out because we are so comfortable. So comfortable. Oh God, oh God, I'll get to it. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'm so busy. We need to be pushed out. It's, it's the same power that, that, that brings out a, a demon from a demon-possessed person. Same power. Same power that thrusts us forward into the mission. It takes great power to drive out a demon. It will need equal power from God to drive out the disciples so that they go out into the harvest. That's what Matthew is saying to us. That's what the Bible is saying to us. We pray for his workers to go into the harvest. But here, here's how the, God's church is so beautiful. Uh, listen carefully. We pray for workers to go out. But we must also acknowledge that someone prayed for us. Yeah. That we are a realization of a movement that came before us. We are an answer to their prayers. I hear it often. We're, we're, we're those who are part of our community, those who are, how do I say this, more mature in physical age. That, that, came, out, that came out polite. Okay, great. I, I hear it often. One, I'm super thankful that you're here. I really am. But I hear, I hear it so often from you when you go, this church is an answer to prayer. One of your family is an answer to prayer. That they, they, there's a movement that came before you that prayed, that prayed for a church like this. And not just this one, but, but many other churches. We pray recognizing that someone has prayed for us. And so this tells us, Rooted Fellowship, that, that, that the resurrected life is a life on mission. It just is. We pray. Someone prayed for us. We engage. We're praying for others that God would send them out. We pray. Like, it's, it's the whole time because the harvest is ready. The resurrected life is a life on mission. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, from verse 16 to 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This is after Jesus is resurrected, right? He then says to his disciples, you've seen me do all these things now. All authority has been given to me, he says. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. It's a great commission. And this great commission is a commandment. 
I know if you've been here a while, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm about to say something, and you're going to go, Oni, we hear you say it all the time. Yes, because we are forgetful people, but also there's brand new people in here. So don't judge me. <laughs> but the Great Commission is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. And so many of us treat it like that. And I know you say, that would never come out of my mouth. Yeah, but your actions, your actions show. We treat it like it's a suggestion, like God is going, you know what, if you have time, because I know you're super busy, you've got a lot of things on your plate. So if you have time, could you make disciples? I mean, I'm sorry I even asked. No. He says, if you've crossed the line of faith, you are my disciples. Follow me, he says. Now go make disciples. The great commission. It is a commandment. And, and here's the thing with not just this commandment, but many others. I like to, when I read the Bible, I go, okay, what... What is a commandment? What is, what, is, what is God telling me and us to do? And then where is he kind of giving us freedom to do that which he's called us to do? And so here's, I, I split it up. I go, when I read the Bible, there is gospel doctrine and then there's gospel culture. Gospel doctrine, we can't get around that. You can't get around making disciples. Go and make disciples. That is a commandment. If you're a Christian, that is what you are called to do. This is why I say you can't be bored. Because I know some will go, no, I'm waiting for Jesus to tell me where to go make disciples. <laughs> where are you now? Yeah. That's where you make disciples. Yeah. No, 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 I'm in transition. Okay, cool. As you are in transition, make disciples. No, I'm, I'm waiting for an opportunity. Great. As you wait for that opportunity, like if you're at home affairs and you're waiting to get your ID, that's an opportunity for you to make disciples. Yeah. How could you say that? on Because there's people. And because they're at home affairs, they are distressed and dejected and worn out and, and all of them. Go gospel doctrine is a commandment. Love your enemy. I just can't get around that one. Gospel culture is what we do in response to that commandment, how we flesh it out. And, 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 and here's the thing about gospel culture. That oftentimes, the Bible doesn't tell us how to do it. It's almost going, hey, you've got the Holy Spirit. Lean into him. He'll give you wisdom and counsel. Now go do it. And, and look, it's going to look different from, from season to season, from context to context, from culture to culture, from generation to generation. But it flows from gospel doctrine. Yeah. It's, like, it's like football. Right? Sorry if you're not into sports, but football's a big deal. Um, they, they're 11 players on the field, on a team. Gospel doctrine. You can't, get a, you can't show up and go, you know what, actually I'd like to have 15. Then go play rugby. Yeah. You, you can't pick up the ball and run around when you play football. You, you can't. There are other sports where you can do you, gospel doctrine. Gospel culture is you go, well, as a team, here's how we want to set up our formation. Hey, that's on you. That's on the wisdom of the coach and, 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 and the, the, the directors and the leaders. And hey, you figure it out. But it's 11 players a team. And, and I think sometimes we make the mistake of taking gospel culture and elevating it to gospel doctrine. And then we go to war with one another. Oh, you use that curriculum. Well, it's unbiblical. Show me where. Where, where. where did Jesus use a curriculum? Can you show me? He did say, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. How do we do that? Holy Spirit, help these people. And so we should be careful, friends. Very careful. Because I get it. I get it. Remember I said it differs from context to context, culture to culture, church to church. You might show up and go, gospel doctrine, but I don't like the gospel culture. Okay, cool. Hey man, let me help you find another church that does the gospel culture that way. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because if you don't, you run the danger of bringing division yeah. over gospel culture. Hmm. That was an off-ramp that I wasn't planned. It's for free. Take it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That is a commandment. Jesus said this to his disciples after his resurrection. It's a well-known verse in the Bible. 
Many people quote it. Many churches have it like plastered up in their buildings. The question is, are you doing it? But we also see this command in Acts chapter 1. When the disciples ask Jesus if in this moment he's restoring the nation of Israel. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but let me start at the beginning so you have some context. The writer of the book of Acts, many believe that it's Luke, so do I. The same Luke that wrote the gospel according to Luke. He starts off by saying in verse 1, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus. Theophilus is the person that he wrote to, and there's not a whole lot said about this individual. But what's interesting is what his name means. Theophilus means loved by God, friend of God. Who are we, people? I believe that that's a real person, but but in God's beautiful, just creative genius and, and sovereign power, he says, write this to Theophilus, and here's what his name means, and one day, those who are loved by God will read it. All right? I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this point? Now, for the longest of time, I used to read this and go, oh, you disciples are so stupid. I mean, come on. You've hung out with Jesus. You, you, you've been so, like, why would you ask such a stupid question? But then I started to read the Bible, which is something I would recommend. And as I read the Bible, I realized quickly that that is not a stupid, in fact, that's a really good question. I almost felt like the disciples were looking at me and going, who's the dummy now? (laughs) It's a good question. Let me explain. You see, the Old Testament plainly taught that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, Israel is going to be restored and the kingdom is going to come. Ezekiel chapter 39, let me read verse 25, says this. So this is what the Lord God says. Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have compassion on the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name. Jump down to verse 29. It says, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel. This is the declaration of the Lord God. So, so disciples are going, hey, we've read Ezekiel. And then also at the Last Supper, Jesus, we remember you talking about the, the, the outpouring of the Spirit, the kingdom coming. In fact, you said, I bestow on you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, they're putting all this together and they're going, okay, you're restoring Israel. So they asked the question. Again, for the longest of time, I used to think Jesus' response here was, one of ridicule and sarcasm and and rebuke. It's not. It's one of compassion. Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. So just relax. I I feel the energy. I, I see the passion. But just hold on. And then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the Great Commission. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be so filled with splach nizome, and then you will be empowered by him to go where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And and, and notice here, he doesn't say you will go to Jerusalem and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. That's not how it works. It's and. That it's happening all together simultaneously. That's how the kingdom of God expands. It's beautiful. It's not like step one, then we need to finish everything in step one. Okay, step two, then we finished. Everyone, everyone, everyone okay, we, you shared, you shared, okay, great. Step, no, 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 it's, it's step one, step two. Like, it's all happening at the same time. And it's a beautiful thing to see it's even more beautiful to be a part of. Let me show you a quick story. Many of you may not know this, but I'm originally from Botswana. 
proud, love it, love my, it's amazing, it's an amazing place. I was born there, at the age of 13, I was sent out, <clears throat> not by God, but by my parents. Uh, they sent me out and I went to boarding school and that's when I came to South Africa. Right, long story, I didn't have time, but I became a Christian at the University of Pretoria. Heard the gospel clearly communicated. God was like, okay, now is the moment. Boom, my life wrecked for his glory. And then I end up doing a whole ton of things. It's amazing and incredible. Uh, fast forward, now I'm here. I would have, ne- friends, <laughs> I would have never imagined this. This was not part of the plan. And, and my wife can testify to that. But here we are. And so I find myself preaching God's word. I, I love God's word. I really do. I absolutely love God's word. And I want people to hear it. And so I sit and I study, but I study it first primarily for myself. I go, I'm devoted to your word. God, speak to me first. And so if you ever sit here after a Sunday, you're like, oh, that passage, oh, that sermon hit hard. It hit me hard first. And so I preach God's word. I want to be faithful to God. We're part of a a network called Acts 29. Acts 29 wants to plant churches where there are no churches. We want to be obedient to the Great Commission, and so we have multiple partners and, and, and churches that are part of the network. And so anyway, uh, I found myself in Dubai a couple of months ago. I uh, was there for some meetings for Acts 29. I got the opportunity to preach at an Acts 29 church in Dubai. Incredible. It's about 12 years old. They're doing amazing things. But anyway, I'm up there, and I'm preaching. Remember, here's this boy born in Botswana. The city of Pretoria has more people than the whole country of Botswana, just to give context. So it's a small place, large in size, but people very small. Amazing people, though. Yo, guys, they are people from Botswana. Ah, ha, ha. Yo, but anyway. Moved to South Africa, get saved, marry a South African, incredible. And then all of this happens. I find myself in Dubai. I'm preaching. I just want to be faithful. And so I preach. And then I know because the gospel demands a response. And so I do one at the end. I say, this is an invitation. Receive the invitation and be saved. We wrap up, it's all done, finished. I didn't realize that that there was a, a, a refugee seeking asylum in Dubai from Afghanistan. He had managed to find his way into the church, right, through connections and relationships. Doesn't speak a word of English. Also doesn't understand it. I don't speak Farsi, which is one of the languages that's spoken there. I just, I, I, I think I'm pretty impressive, but that's the one thing I'm not good at. So he has a translator translating everything that I'm saying to him in a language that he understands. Here's the fact that the gospel demands a response, and then turns to the translator and says, I want to receive this invitation. Interpreter goes, great. Praise with him. The man walks into the kingdom of God. I believe that that's how it happens, because the Bible says so. Now, friends, I never imagined that I would go to Afghanistan, let alone meet someone from there. I just just, just didn't. And yet, here's what God does. He goes, because you're being obedient to the mission, here's how it works. This is my Jerusalem. Neighboring countries, Judea. Afghanistan to me is the ends of the earth. And yet, here we have this encounter. I never met him. I met the translator. We had a really good conversation. True story. And he's like, man, incredible. It was amazing. Thank you. Epic. But I I don't know if it's going to happen like this, but I'm I'm hoping it does. That one day in heaven, I'm going to meet that man. Like our, 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 our lives will collide again because they collided in that moment. They will collide again. And this time, we'll be able to understand each other. And, and, and it's not going to be about me. It's going to be about the one who is seated on the throne. And then now we're going to be sharing stories of, of what God did after that point. It's like, man, I just got back on a plane and came back home and started preaching a new sermon series. And then God did some really cool things. And then I don't know what God is going to do with him. I know he's plugged into a healthy local church. I'm hoping and praying that he gets discipled because that's their commitment to disciple people. And then we're just going to share stories of like, and here's what God did, and here's what God did, and here's what God did, and here's what God did. Praise Jesus. 
It's beautiful to hear. It's more beautiful to be a part of. And that's the invitation. When he says, you will be my witnesses. That's the invitation. I don't understand how we could be bored. I just don't. Making disciples is about discovering and deepening. Discovering Jesus and deepening in a relationship with him. That's what we long for. We want the lost to get found and the found to become free. That's what it's about. Now, the question is, having heard all of that, what does that mean for us? Right? What, like, okay, Oneh, so what now? What are we supposed to do? What, what are the practical things that, 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 that we can do? If, if the resurrected life is a life on mission, what does that mean for us? Well, here's a couple of things. It's not all of them. It's not an extensive list. It's just a few things that I'm going to share with you. And my hope is that you're already plugged in here at Richard Fellowship. You're part of a family group. You're part of a discipleship group. And you, you'll, you'll flesh this stuff out even more. That's my hope. That's what I pray for. So I'm just going to give you a few of them. Number one, ready, set, we pray. We have got to become a praying community. And there's a lot of really cool things that are happening here. We, we pray up here. There's a prayer corner. We've established it for that. We're saying we just want people to come when they see it to pray. You can come pray up front here. At the back, there's a place where you can reflect and chat and pray. We are a praying community crying out to the Father to empower us to see that the harvest is abundant. It's ready. It's ripe. So we pray. Second thing we could do is you could invite someone to church. That simple. Invite someone to community, to a healthy community. Uh, it's Samuel here in the room. I know I saw him this morning. Is he, is he here? So, serving at Children's Discipleship. Incredible. I love that guy. I just want to honor him a, a little bit. You guys can tell him that I did this. He, he is such an incredible evangelist. He just is. And I'm not talking about titles here. I'm not, guys, I don't care about titles. I'm talking about the gift. He is such an incredible evangelist that all he wants to do is bring people. He's like, hey, like every time I talk to him, he's like, hey, man, you know, I invited someone. I mean, I, and I, I, don't want, I, I don't want you to put up, don't put up your hand. I don't want to be that person. But I think that there's someone he invited this morning as well. It's very possible. That's what he does. He's just, he's just like, man, here's how I am contributing. Here's how I'm being obedient to the Great Commission. Hey, do you want to come to church with me on Sunday? Absolutely. He's such a beautiful person with such a beautiful heart. And I have seen him grow. I mean, here's how he landed here. Quick story. So I think he was doing promotions. Help me out here. He was doing promotions. And there was a, a, a guy here who used to be a part of Rooted Fellowship called Mike Mayer, who's also an incredible evangelist. He's no longer with us. He, he is part of a church that we sent out just wanting to be obedient to the Great Commission. So he's part of a church called Fellowship City in the Centurion area. But he was part of what we called the original six. There was six of us, including my wife and I, who were part of starting Rooted Fellowship. Six adults and a six-month-old baby girl. That baby girl is about to turn eight in a couple of months. And we would show up with her everywhere. Parents? Parents? Your kids can see what you value the most. You don't have to say it. Literally, every, because every, it wasn't at our house. Get out, put our little baby in there, and go. And people were all so concerned. She'll never sleep. She'll, it's too late. Well, God was gracious. We'd come home, put her in the car, done. she would sleep the whole night. It's amazing. But she wouldn't sleep while we were there. You like, remember, you check, and her eyes like this, this big. I think she was listening listening to us talk about Jesus and pray. And then God, God's so gracious. He, you know what he does? He, he grants us favor that she comes to, to faith. And then we get to baptize her in the very church that she was part of the core team in planting, because she was. She is so missional. You, you have no idea. The conversations we have in the car about, and, and how she prays. She is praying for her uncle, my brother, to come to faith. And I believe that God is going to grant that prayer to this little girl. I believe it. 
Back to Tiamo. So Mike meets him at a promotion, says to him, hey, well, why don't you come to church? So he shows up. God does a work in him. The Tiamo you see today, <laughs> it's a different Tiamo. Gets baptized here because that's the first step of obedience that you take after coming to faith. So if you haven't been baptized, please come speak to me because we would love to get you in the waters. And here's the beautiful thing about being baptized. You're also being on mission because you invite people to that baptism. And then when you're in the waters, you're going, I love Jesus. He has saved me. He gives me life and he wants to do the same for you. You're on mission. God, God can do the incredible. All you have to do is to say to someone, hey, you want, you want to come to this community? Just come hear, come hear something. It's changed my life. I believe it'll change yours. Third thing we can do is pray. Yeah, let's pray some more. We pray. The fourth thing that you can do is tell someone what you are learning or experiencing. If you're growing in your relationship with Jesus, just tell someone. I know some of you are going, yeah, but I'm an introvert. Guess what, people? So am I. I know it might, it's shocking, but I am a massive introvert. After this, I just want to go home, curl up in bed, and be like, I just want to be by myself. I'm so, there's so many people, so many questions. So, no, 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 but, but I love it. Just tell someone what you're learning. Hey, I, we're learning this on a Sunday. I heard, it's incredible. Here's how it's changing my life. I just want to share that with you. And see what happens. The worst thing that could happen is someone go, I don't want to hear this and walk away. That's the worst thing that could happen. In light of eternity, that's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So tell someone what you're learning and experiencing. Number five, pray. Let's pray. Pray about what you just said to that person. Number six, ask meaningful questions. Jesus did this all the time, the art of good questions. Just ask questions, and people love talking about themselves. So tell me, what do you do? Oh, thank you. Well, actually, I am a... And somewhere in there, you're going to get an opportunity to go, oh, okay, hold on. You spoke about something that happened to you that was painful. Hey, listen, so how are you wrestling with this? I also went through, and here's what Jesus did. Boom. Just ask questions. Number seven, pray. Number eight, just value people. Ask God, to say, God, would you give me your heart? Splach nizo make. Would you grow that in me? That when I see things, yes, I'm filled with righteous anger, but that I would move towards compassion. We're all made in the image of God, people. Just value people. Number nine, pray. Number ten, share, teach. Preach the gospel because it's good for salvation and for sanctification. It is. So share the gospel. And, and let, me, let me ask the question. Well, let me make this statement. If you can't remember the last time you shared the gospel, you should be deeply concerned about who is your first love. Let me say that again. If you can't remember the last time you shared the gospel, oh no, what's the gospel? Look, hey, saying, Jesus died for your sins. Right now, the way that you are living, it's, it's not going to end well. Surrender your life to him because he, he doesn't just make your life better. He is life. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. Look to the cross. Look to the finished work of Christ. Will you surrender? Like some variation of that. If you cannot remember the last time you did that, you should be deeply concerned about who your first love is. Because here's the thing, we are telling people about a ton of stuff. We're telling them about the stats of our favorite team. We're telling them about the economic stats of what's going on globally. We're telling them about what's happening on the news. We're telling them about what Kim Kardashian wore two weeks ago. We're, t we're, t we're telling people about our favorite comic book superhero movies. That one's on me. So share, and then pray, and then the last one, before I ultimately pray for all of us, is be intentional. Yeah. And here, just start with one. Yeah. Just start with one person, 
One person that you're saying, God, I'm going to be intentional about. Just one. And, and, and watch the Lord work. And by His grace, He's going to do something. And then what do you do? You go to one more. Amen. And then watch Him work, and then you go to one more. And so I think we should have a ton of one mores in this church. Yeah. One more person that we're praying for. God, just one. God, would you just do it again one more time? One more tiamo. One more. You should have that name so ingrained in your mind because you're praying for them all the time. One more, God. One more family member. One more friend. One more neighbor. One more colleague. Just one more. Because the harvest is abundant. And he is mighty to save. He is mighty to say, we're about to sing that song now, friends. Please, this, this, is, this is not Christian karaoke. Okay? We don't show up and then they sing and then we sing and it's like, this is fun. And, okay, no, no, no. When we sing these words, we sing them because we believe them. And so you think about your one more. And then as we sing, we say, God, you are mighty to save. Mighty, so would you save that one more? And then God, what do I do? What, what do I need to do? Guys, we all have abilities. Ability is great. It really is, and God uses it. You are some of the most gifted people in the world. Ability is important. But you know what God wants first? He wants your availability. Because I've seen him do the most incredible things with people who just make themselves available but have no ability. And I've seen the most, the most gifted people with the most amazing abilities, but because they're operating out of their own strength, that ability becomes a disability. Mighty to save, just one more. And so, Father God, I pray that as we sing this song, Lord, as, as we think about our one more, as we think about what it means to be on mission, God, I pray that you would empower us, you would clothe us with grace, that all that we have experienced and continue to experience from you, God, I pray that we would want to see this happen with those who are around us where we live and work and play. All of them have been made in your image, but they are far from you. And God, I know your desire is for them to be with you, to be at your table, to share in your goodness and your favor it's your loving kindness that leads us to repentance. And so God, I pray right now in this very room that there might be people who have not crossed the line of faith, who have not surrendered their lives to you. Lord, I pray that they would take that step and say, I am in need of life, not just a better life, but life. And Jesus, you are that life. Save them. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are saved but need healing and reconciliation and restoration. Lord, would you meet them where they are? I pray for every single person here in this room. Do the work that only you can do. You are mighty to save. And so would you do that? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.